morning, everybody. Welcome to Wayside. I hope everyone's having a great day so far. But no matter where you're at, ask that you would stand, worship with us. Um, no matter what kind of day you had, the Lord is good, and He always will be. So let's worship Him together. Good morning, Wayside. 
<laughs> My name is Ronald. I have the pleasure of serving as one of the pastors here on staff. We are so glad that you have come to worship with us this morning to get out of the heat for just a little bit in our wonderfully air-conditioned sanctuary. We're so glad that y'all are here with us and worshiping with us today. If this is one of your first times uh, visiting us here at Wayside Chapel, let me extend a special welcome to you. I would love to get to know you a little bit better. And here's a couple ways that we can do that. Uh, the first thing you can do for us, if you've got a smartphone, you could scan this uh, QR code up here on the screen or uh, right in front of you, should be about knee level uh, sometime. You can fill out this online connection card for us. That way we can get to know you a little bit better. Uh, we can introduce you to some of the ministries and happenings going on here at Wayside Chapel. And also at the end of the service, I will be out these double doors and to my right in the Welcome Center. Uh, I'd just love to put a face with the name. I'd love to answer any questions that you might have about Wayside, what we do here, the ministries that we'd have. I'd love to get you connected in any way possible. So let me just invite you to hang out with me a little bit after the service today. Uh, and Wayside, we just want to again say thank you so much for all the ways that you've been giving to Wayside Chapel. Thank you. There are five different ways to give. You see them up here on the screen. Uh, they've just been so faithful to give, and we just want to extend a special thank you uh, for that. Also, we're really excited that today we are starting out our brand new summer series called Rhythms. Uh, we're going to be looking at a couple of spiritual disciplines, uh, some ways that we can grow in our faith, both personally and corporately as a church. We're really excited about that. If you want a reminder about what we're going to be looking at, we have these little square cards. They're right out there in the foyer. You can grab one of those just for you so that you can uh, follow along. You can know what we're doing. There's a QR code on there for some great online resources if you want to take your study a little further than where the sermon goes. And also, if you've got a friend who you'd like to invite to Wayside over the summer, this would be a great way to invite them, to let them know what we're going to be talking about. So you can find these out in the foyer. Pick a couple up, one for yourself, one to give away. We'd absolutely love for you to do that so you can know what's going on here at Wayside during the summer. And last, <laughs> if you are worshiping with us online, this is a great chance to get your communion together. If you are here in the service with us uh, and you did not pick up one of these communion cups, we have some ushers in the back. Just raise your hand a little bit. Uh, the ushers will make sure that you have a communion before we take it at the end of service. So not right now, we'll, we'll take it later, but just make sure that you put your hand up in the air. They're coming down the aisles right now. We want to make sure that you've got one so that you can partic uh, participate with us when the time comes for communion at the end of the service. Awesome. Hey, let me uh, just take a moment to pray for us, please, so we can attune our hearts to the service. Lord, thank you so much for everything that you give us. God, I know that in, in my family, summer's already a little crazy. <laughs> God, I know that with, with traveling and with camps and serving and all these other places, God, summer can feel even crazier than the school year sometimes. So Lord, would you help us focus our hearts now in this moment so that we can worship you for who you are. God, today, as, as Jason comes to encourage us about how we can put some rhythms into our life that would give us the abundant life that you promise us through Jesus, Lord, would you bless him? Lord, would you challenge us to not just listen, but to be changed? Father God, we're so thankful for your son, Jesus. And Lord, I, I pray that we would remember the sacrifice of Jesus that it would be on our hearts and in our minds as we sing these songs and as we worship you. Father, thank you for your great love for us, for how you proved it by sending us Jesus. And so, Lord, it's in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus, I pray you bless this service, you bless Jason, you bless us. And be with us, God. Change us and challenge us. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Would y'all could stand as we continue to worship? I want to see Jesus lifted high. I want to see Jesus lifted high. I want to see Jesus lifted high. 
and see Jesus lifted high. I want to 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 see Jesus lifted high. suffer for a while I have a hope that's undefined I see the part but not the whole and I know this world is not my home I want to see Jesus lifted high I want to see Jesus lifted high. I want to see Jesus lifted high. I want to see Jesus lifted high. and hearts unfold There's King who died to take my place He stood and walked out of the grave Yes, He did He stood and walked out of the grave I want to see Jesus lifted way and you always move 
Well, good morning. Well, we are excited to start a, a new summer series called Rhythms today. Our pastoral team is, is pumped about it. We've been uh, preparing, kind of planning this series for the past few months, and we're looking forward to just seeing what the Lord is going to do with it. And, uh, and the focus of this series is, is simply this. Uh, what does it practically look like to follow Jesus? Uh, on a practical level, like what are, some, what are some habits of devotion that will help us to live more like him? And so we're going to hit on uh, different spiritual disciplines like, like prayer and studying scripture and giving and singing and resting well and sharing the gospel. Uh, different spiritual practices that we see in scripture uh, and practices that are essential if we're going to live the life that Jesus lived. And the reason that we're calling uh, this series Rhythms is because, first off, I, I like the way it sounds, okay? It sounds catchy, okay? Uh, but more importantly, uh, I like the definition of the word rhythm as it speaks to the heart of what we're hoping to accomplish through this series. A simple definition of rhythm is this. It's a strong, regular, repeated pattern of movement. It's a strong, regular, repeated pattern of movement. And, and typically, when we think of rhythm, we, we think of music. Uh, we think of a systematic arrangement of, of musical sounds that produce a pattern. And it's beautiful and it's easy to follow. And that's really the, the heart of, of what we're hoping to accomplish uh, through this series. Our, our prayer is that as a church, okay, we would lean into this series and, and really apply what is being taught so that we can pattern and arrange our lives after Jesus. And the hope is that as we do so, uh, we'd experience something beautiful, that perhaps we'd experience the fullness of life in which Jesus talks about. For Jesus once said, I've come so that you may have life and have it to the full. And that's the, the aim in this series. Like, like, how do we get our arms around the full life that Jesus talks about? Well, I think we do so by imitating his rhythms, by following his pattern of life. And, and personally, uh, I'm excited about this series uh, because what we're talking about this summer is something that I personally want to grow in myself. Uh, because I'm not where I want to be yet. Um, personally, I want to experience more joy, and I want to experience more peace than what I'm currently experiencing. I, I want to know God more than I currently do. I want to become more spiritually and emotionally healthy. But if I desire those things, then I'm going to have to be intentional about creating a better rhythm in my life so that I can position myself to experience what my heart is longing for. Uh, Chuck Swindoll, the famous pastor and theologian, he once said this. He said, show me a godly man and I'll show you a disciplined man behind the scenes. He said, show me a godly man and I'll show you a disciplined man behind the scenes. Listen, you don't just wake up one day and magically become more like Christ. <laughs> That's not how it works. You're not just going to wake up one day and be like, you know, it's sweet. It's like I don't struggle anymore. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> That's not the process of sanctification that we see in the Bible. But if many of us were honest, I think what we're hoping for is that, that one day things will just magically click and we'll finally start living the life that God wants us to live. There's an old business adage that goes like this. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets, meaning that your life is often a byproduct of your lifestyle. Your life is often a byproduct of your lifestyle. Paul talks about this in Galatians 6, 8. He says, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. You see, life is a series of choices. You do reap what you sow. And we become the people we become by what we choose to do again. And for many of us, if we were honest, we don't like who we've become. 
but we're not willing to make any of the necessary changes to do anything about it. And you know what that's called? That's called insanity. <laughs> insanity can be defined this way. It's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. If we want to experience some different results in our lives, then we've got to be willing to make some changes. And the, the good news is that we have a Savior who specializes in transformation. But if you want to experience that transformation, you've got to heed his call where he says, come, follow me, follow me. Jesus doesn't just say, come believe in me. No, Jesus says, come follow me. Come pattern your life after me. Imitate my rhythms. And that's the heart behind this series. And so my encouragement is this. Um, let's do this together. Like this, this summer, as, as a church, let's embrace this series and apply what's being taught because I think all of us, every single person here, every single person listening online, um, we can all do a better job of creating a healthier rhythm in our lives so we can pattern our lives after Jesus. And perhaps if we'll do so, we'll experience the change in our lives that we're always hoping for. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we've got these cards in the foyer. Um, go get one before you leave. Pass them out to classmates, to coworkers, to neighbors, friends. Invite them to church. And then for you personally, use the QR code. Go on our website. Go on the app. And there's going to be additional resources there for you because our hope is not that you just come and listen to a preacher preach, but that you would listen to the message and then dive deeper on your own. That's the hope. So jump in there. Uh, we're going to be in Ephesians 5 this morning, if you want to go ahead and turn there. But before we jump in, um, would you just take a moment and just pray and just ask for God to move? And so just take a moment right now, wherever you're at, and ask God to move in your heart this morning. Well, Father, we give you this time and we want to ask you to have your way. And God, would you help me to preach? I can't do this without you. And so would you use me now and fill me with your spirit so that I can preach what you want me to preach? And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's start by reading just a couple verses from Ephesians 5. Uh, we're just going to read verses 15 through 17. If you want to open there, great. If not, just listen. As I read, it's not long. It says this, verse 15, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Amen. Well, I've only got three main points today. They're taken straight from the text. And the first one is this. Be careful how you walk. Be careful how you walk. Paul says as you go about life, don't just drift through it like a fool. Don't just go with the flow. Rather, be intentional with how you live and live with a sense of reverence, with reverence. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we've gone on a few ski trips uh, with my family, usually to Colorado, uh, which, side note, um, if you want to test your dating relationship, you want to see how committed they are to you, uh, put them in a car with your family for 20 hours, okay? Um, you're going to find out real quick uh, whether they are the one that God has for you because uh, that experience might, you know, just speed up the process, okay, if they're not. Um, or you'll persevere like my wife did and been happily married for 12 plus years, okay? Um, but a few years ago, my, my wife and I, we were driving back from, from Colorado with my family, and, and we, we hit some, some icy weather in a small East Texas town called Balmeray. And as we were driving, uh, slowly on this highway, it's a two-lane highway, and it started to come to a stop because there's ice on the road. When my dad would tap on the brake, he would start to slide. And we realized we were kind of in a predicament. And all of a sudden, uh, Every few hundred feet, we'd look over to the side and we'd see a big semi-truck laying on its side off to the road. <laughs> and 
And we started looking around. We were like, what in the world is going on? And then all of a sudden, I hear my dad cry out in this voice that I've never really heard before. And he says, everybody, hold on. Hold on. And we turn and look. And there's a big semi in the left lane. We are in the right. It couldn't stop. It hit some black ice. It was coming straight towards us. We saw the tail end of that truck. It started to move, and it looked like it was about to hit our car. There was nothing we can do about it. Talked to my dad about it. He'll get teary-eyed talking about it because he had this, feel, this sinking feeling in his gut, knowing there was nothing he could do. This could be it. And by God's grace, that truck, right before it hit our car, it swung back to the other side and went past us. And then it kept going a few hundred more yards until finally it jackknifed. And then we figured out why all these semis are on the side of the road because they have to pull that truck off and lay it down. <laughs> and after a few more trucks doing this, they finally decided, you know, it's probably, uh, we need to shut down the highway. <laughs> uh, and so they did. And we became refugees, okay, because they then detoured us into this small West Texas town where we spent the night in the community center in Balmeray, okay? And I've got a whole nother uh, sermon illustration for you, but I, I'm not going to share about that today, okay? That was an experience for itself, but I'll tell you, okay, um, because of the events and because of the hazardous conditions, you better believe that our senses came alive, okay? As we... We're slowly driving this, down this line of cars to this small West Texas town. We became fully aware of everything that was going on around us. We became alive. <laughs> alive. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's encouraging believers to live like that. He says, listen up. He says, the days are evil. This world is a hazardous place, so make sure that you are fully aware of your surroundings and follow the path that God has laid out before you with trembling and great reverence. The Greek here for be careful, it carries the connotation of precision and accuracy. Paul is saying, walk carefully with exactness. Don't just drift through life, rather be intentional with how you're living Paul contrasts here the way of the fool versus the way of the wise. And his words here echo the entire theme of the book of Proverbs. The word proverb in Hebrew literally means a comparison. And essentially what the book of Proverbs is, is the author is comparing the life of the fool versus the life of the wise. And the author of, of Proverbs teaches from the role of a father and he's pleading with his child to study wisdom. He says, child, there's a natural rhythm to how this world works. Follow it and live accordingly. And the father in Proverbs, he cries out to his child and he says, walk in this way and there's joy and there's satisfaction and there's purpose. But if you walk in this way, there's vanity and there's destruction and grief and death. And that's not just the message of Proverbs, that's the message of the Bible. Because the Bible says, unashamedly, there are only two routes in life. There's the way of the wise, and there's the way of the fool. And the reason we need to be careful with how we live is because we live in a fool's world. The world that you and I live in is a world dominated by fools. The natural tide of the world is the way of the fool. Well, why do I say that? Well, I don't think I need to convince most of you. <laughs> but we live in a day and age where the way of the fool, it reigns supreme. And the reason I think that to be true is because I have a biblical definition of what a fool is. A fool, according to scripture, is anyone who exists apart from God's wisdom. A fool is someone who considers God and his ways foolish. That's what 1 Corinthians 2.14 says. It says the natural man or the worldly man does not understand the way of God. They are foolishness to him. To the world, those who believe that Jesus Christ is God, those who try to live their life according to biblical standards, we're the fools. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 
Do you see the dichotomy in Scripture? Yet the God of the Bible says a true fool is someone who makes a mockery of sin. That's Proverbs 14, 9. A true fool is someone who draws up and makes up their, their own rules. They're the God of their own life. They choose how they want to live. What's right and wrong is based off a of personal preference. Does that sound familiar? Is that not the world we live in? And the reason this world is run by fools is because every human born on the face of this planet is born into foolishness. That's Proverbs twenty-two fifteen. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Because of that horrific decision in the garden where Adam and Eve decided to rebel against God, sin entered into the heart of every man. And as a result, every single one of us is born into sin. We're born into foolishness, despising the things of God. In Ephesians 2, it puts it this way. You are by nature children of wrath. Meaning that while God has come up with this beautiful plan of how to live life, we've rejected that plan and decided to go our own way. And the natural consequences of our rebellion, it's horrific. For Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, physical and eternal separation from God. Because apart from God, there is no life. There's no life. For if God is truly the author of life, anything that strays away from God naturally dies. It dies. That's the, at least that's the message of Scripture. But that's not a popular take nowadays, is it? Uh, to the world, that doesn't seem fair. That's too exclusive. And we live in a world that's hostile towards anything that's exclusive. But Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one gets to the Father unless he comes through me. An incredibly exclusive claim. In the book of Acts, as Peter defends the gospel, he says this about Jesus. He says, salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. That's the message of Christianity. There is no salvation apart from Jesus. There is no life apart from Jesus you can't live a wise life apart from Jesus. And praise be to God, the scriptures say that despite our rebellion, our God chased after us. And he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. You want to talk about something unfair? Let's talk about Jesus, a perfectly innocent person, did nothing wrong, substituting himself and dying for our sins. What's fair about that? Ain't nothing fair about it. That's just grace. And through the resurrection, Jesus offers to anyone who would trust in him new life. Through Christ, Jesus offers us a life of wisdom. Jesus says, you want to know how life works? Well, I created it all, so let me show you. But to the world, that message is foolishness. The world says, don't bound yourself by divine principles. Just, just do whatever you feel is right. Is that not the culture that you and I live in right now? But the message of the Bible is there is a right way to live. There are divine laws and rhythms that guide this universe that have been put into place by a very real and a very personal and powerful God. There is a purpose to this life, but that purpose cannot be found unless you check into the divine source who created all things. And that's the message of Scripture. Now, some of you are like, Pastor, chill out, brother. You preach into the choir, okay? Like, like, we already believe that, man. That's why we're at church. We get it. But the reason I'm saying all this is because even if you believe in Jesus, even if you believe in everything I just said, if we are not intentional about how we live, we will go down the path of the fool because that's the natural tide of this world. The natural tide of this world is against the things of God. Therefore, even as a believer, if you're gonna live for the Lord, you're swimming upstream. And that ain't easy. That's not easy. In Ephesians 5, Paul is not talking to non-believers. He's talking to believers. He says, be careful how you walk because if you're not, you'll waste your life 
and you'll go down the path of the fool. In the main way that believers in Christ will be tempted to waste their life is by foolishly misusing time and opportunity. The main way you and I will potentially waste our life is is by foolishly misusing time and opportunity. As followers of Christ, we need to be careful how we walk. That's number one. And then number two, we need to make the most of our time. We need to make the most of our time. I preached over Hebrews 12 a few months ago. And in Hebrews 12.1, it says, let us lay aside every weight and run the race that is set before us. In other words, God has determined a very specific race for you and I to run. There's a start to this race and there's a finish. In Psalm 139.16, the Bible tells us that all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be, meaning God already knows exactly when and how each of us will die. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, 27, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? He says it's already been determined. God already knows how long you're gonna live on this earth. The question we get to decide is what are we gonna do with the time we've been granted? James put it this way in chapter four. He said, don't say tomorrow we'll do this or that. For you know not what tomorrow brings for your life is a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. In Psalm 90, verse 12, the psalmist prays. He says, teach us to number our days. Why? Because it's wisdom to take account of the limited time we have on this earth. Last week, um, my oldest graduated kindergarten. (laughs) Uh, Big moment. She had her cap cap on, went over her ears. Uh, but it felt, like, it felt like just yesterday that we were bringing home that sweet girl from the hospital. And those first few weeks, man, were a blur. Okay, you young parents out there, I'm praying for you. Okay? Some of you there right now. And in the blink of an eye, that little baby has developed this amazing little personality. She can read and write. She's swimming on the swim team. And she's making choices that are developing her into the woman that she will one day grow up to be. But it goes by fast, doesn't it? All of us can remember events that seem like just yesterday. For some of you, you can remember events that happened 10, 20, 50 years ago. Every breath we take is a gift, isn't it? Your life is a gift. Don't waste it pursuing meaningless things because you only get one shot at this thing. This type of mindset really hit me. Uh, Summer before college, thankfully pretty early. That's where I trusted in Christ with my life, surrendered my life to him. And uh, and for college, I went to Texas A&M University. uh, And uh, all my cousins and family were there. We were kind of brainwashed from birth, right? That's like, that's the only route, man. There there were no no two routes in life. There was one, okay? Um, (laughs) And so that's where we all ended up. And, and God, really, my freshman year of college, like, that's where, I, that's where I started following Jesus. And I was like this, this family evangelist, okay? Like, like, I was going around to all my cousins, and I just, I wanted to share the gospel with them. Uh, and so I was constantly looking for opportunities to do so. And I remember this one time, I, I was at my cousin's place, and I was talking to him about the gospel. And I'll never forget his response. He said, Jason, he said, I agree with everything you're saying, He said, but I kind of just want to do things my way right now. He said, I just want to have fun. He said, when I'm like 40, I'll start taking my faith seriously. And I remember I was just befuddled by his response. And I was like, bro, like, how do you know you're going to live till you're 40? And he just kind of shrugged his shoulders. And we went on with the night. And fast forward a few months, where I'm sitting at his funeral because of an unexpected calamity where he lost his life in a car wreck. And I share that story with you not to scare you. I share it because it's a reality. We get one opportunity to live this thing. You got one life. How are you going to live it? How are you going to live it? Someone mathematically calculated once 
a schedule that compares the average lifetime with a single day beginning at 7 a.m. And this is what they came up with. So if your age is 15, the time right now is 10.25 a.m. If your age is 25, the time is 12.42 p.m. If you are 35, the time is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If you are 45, the time is 5.16 p.m. If you are 55, the time is 7.34 p.m. If you are 65, the time is 9.55 at night. And if you are 70, the time is 11 p.m. The time is ticking, church. The question is, how are you going to utilize the remaining time that you have? Because remember, it's wisdom to number our days. The problem with most of us myself included, is we struggle at prioritizing our time well. And the reason many of us do not prioritize our time well is because we get so darn distracted, don't we? We live in the most distracted generation of all time, okay? If you ask anybody how they're doing, I don't care who I go up to, use it for, hey, hey, how are things going? What's the typical response? Oh, I'm doing good, just busy, Doing good. Just be, I don't care if you talk to a five-year-old, okay? <laughs> a college student, young marrieds, empty nesters, everybody's busy, you know? Everybody. We live in the busiest society of all time. And I don't think it's because we necessarily work harder than generations before us. No, for most of us, for many of us, we're busier because we don't prioritize the right things and because we are easily distracted and we've become addicted to instantaneous stimulation. So we're constantly on the move, constantly moving on to the next article, the next task, the next TikTok video, the next news story, the next social media post, the next video game, and we never pause to consider God's still small voice. And then if we do make time It's for such a brief moment that his voice is drowned out by all the other noise and distractions. In Richard Foster's book, The Celebration of Discipline, he says this, in contemporary society, our adversary majors in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us engaged in muchness and manyness, he will rest satisfied. And that was written like 50 years ago, before the internet was even invented. (laughs) Corey Ten Boom once said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Both sin and busyness have the same effect. They cut off your connection to God, to other people, and even to your own soul. I just read John Mark Comer's book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And in that book, he says this, He says, Satan doesn't show up as a demon with a pitchfork. He's far more intelligent than we give him credit for. You are far more likely to run into the enemy in the form of an alert on your phone while reading your Bible or a multi-day Netflix binge or a full-on dopamine addiction to Instagram or Saturday morning at the office or commitment after commitment after commitment in a life of speed, of speed. John Ortberg says this about Christians. He said, for many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living it. Does that resonate with anybody or just me? (laughs) In John Comer's book, he He says this, a stat about the average iPhone use. And it says the average iPhone user touches his or her phone 2,617 times a day. Another study done for millennials, which is my generation, put that number at twice that. (laughs) And that's just phone use. It's not talking about your computer. It's not talking about checking your email. It's not talking about watching ESPN or the news or weather. So much time is lost in the black hole of the device. 
I was talking to a guy in our singles ministry a few years ago, and he said, you know what I call social media? And I said, no, what? He said, I call social media WMD, weapons of mass distraction. (laughs) Now listen, um, I don't think that we all need to throw away our phones or delete our social media accounts or quit our jobs. Uh, Maybe some of you do, pray about it, okay. Um, But my point isn't that all this stuff is in and of itself bad. Social media, technology, our jobs, all of these things can be used for good. I'm not saying that we need to cut everything out of our lives. But what I am saying is I think we do need to deeply consider our schedules and then ask ourselves, am I making the most of the time that God has granted me? And then if we're not, then may we be willing to make some changes. In fact, let me give you like a really simple homework activity if you're bold. I want you just to, for a week, keep a log, keep a log of of all of the time that you spend on trivial things. Time wasted on trivial things. Just one week, just give it a shot. And I guarantee you, you're gonna be shocked at how much time is wasted on entertainment. In Ephesians 5, Paul warns believers to walk wisely. He begs believers to make the most of their time. In the Greek, he literally says, redeem the time, redeem it, buy it back. You've got to fight for it. Make the most of every opportunity because you only get one shot. And every day is a gift. It's a gift. We get one shot at this thing. How are we going to live it? How are we going to live it? Which is why Paul says, number one, be careful how you walk. Number two, make the most of your time. And then number three, understand God's will for your life. Now, we could do a whole sermon on the, on the will of God. Uh, but at its most basic, the will of God is this. We're supposed to repent of our sin and then turn to Jesus. That's God's will for every single one of us. Repent of sin, turn to Jesus. And then once we trust in Christ for the first time, God's will is that we would continue repenting of sin and following Jesus, imitating his life and pattering pattering our lives after him. God desires a relationship with us. This is God's will for you. God's will is that you would know Jesus on a deep level that you'd spend time with him, that you'd experience his love, that you'd experience his grace. He wants to manifest, manifest his grace through you. That's, that's God's will for your life. But in order to experience a deeper relationship with God, in order to better understand his will for our lives, we've got to intentionally slow down so that we can give God our attention if we're ever gonna experience the fullness of life that Jesus talks about, then we've gotta cultivate some different habits in our life so that we can give ourselves the opportunity to grow, which is why we're doing this series. That's what we're doing this summer is we're, we're trying to take a step back and we're saying, hey, how can we develop some, like a new routine? How can we develop some practices so that we can better prioritize our time for God's glory? So instead of spending two hours on Facebook, I'm gonna do something productive and I'm gonna use that time for prayer, for Bible study, for reading. Maybe I'm gonna go for a run. I'm gonna spend time with family. Instead of over committing myself, I'm going to make sure that I've intentionally carved out time for my spouse so I can better get to know them in a deeper way. Instead of indulging in another form of entertainment, I'm going to think about the children that God has blessed me with and I'm going to foster that relationship. How can I best utilize my time for God's glory? And how can I experience the fullness of life that Jesus speaks of, a life that consists of more joy, more peace, more harmony, more satisfaction, more healing and more purpose? But if we want that life, we gotta be willing to make some sacrifices. But I promise you, the sacrifices we make will pale in comparison to the life that we gain. Uh, My third born little girl, uh, her name is Kinsley. 
and Kinsley, uh, her birthday is on July 25th. She is turning two, okay? And uh, her hair is starting to come in. Okay? My, my, my kids are usually bald until age two, okay? And, and Kinsley is at the age uh, where she is learning words by the day, and she is just babbling nonstop, like babble, 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 babble. And she talks with her hands, just like daddy, okay? <laughs> and a few weeks ago, uh, I was on my, on my phone, wasting time on my phone on the couch, and, and Kinsley was sitting right next to me. And as I was on my phone, she'd say, dada, dada. And I'd look at her, and then she'd babble. No idea what she's saying. So I go back to my phone, start reading whatever I'm reading. And then she'd say, dada, dada. And I'd look at her, same thing. Babble, babble, talking with her hands. I'd nod, I'd go back to my phone. And then finally, about the third or fourth time, she'd say, dada, dada. And I didn't immediately turn and look at her. And my girl literally got in front of me. She grabbed my head. <laughs> she turned my face towards her. And she said, Dada, Dada. <laughs> and my girl couldn't say the words, but she didn't need to, because I knew exactly what she was saying. She was saying, Dada, I want to spend time with you. Dada, give me your attention. Dada, I want a relationship with you. And I'm really glad she did because Dada was being selfish and I needed to come to my senses. Listen, church, what we give our attention to showcases the values of our heart. What we give our attention to shows what we really care about and my question to all of you is what about you where's your attention what takes most of that time and does it represent the values of your heart and if not if you're still breathing then there's still time for you to repent and reorient your life so that you can prioritize the things that matters most God will help you but you're going to have to slow down so that he can speak to you and get away from all those distractions. And that's the purpose of this series. We want to cultivate new habits in our lives so that we can prioritize the things that matter most. Jesus once said, he said, come to me. All you are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from you. From me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The invitation's on the table. Will you come? Are you tired of living the same unfulfilled life? Are you burdened? Are you weary? Well, come to Jesus. Pattern your life after him. Imitate his ways and cut off the things that don't matter and cultivate the things that do. Because life is short. So let's make the most of our time. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to start processing right now as we come to the communion table. And so we're gonna take communion together here in a moment. Uh, but before we do, uh, I just wanna give you a moment just to pause and just come before God. I want you to boldly ask and say, God, where's my attention been? Is it on the right things? And if not, I want you to pray. Say, God, would you show me how I can start cutting things out of my life, cutting out distractions so I can focus on what really matters. So I'm gonna give you a few moments to do that and then we'll take communion together here in a minute. So do that right now.
church, what communion reminds us of is that despite all our flaws and despite all the times we've wasted opportunities, our God still loves us. And that's why he went to the cross. He died for our sins. He spilled his blood for you and I so that we could have new life, so that we could have grace. And because of what Christ did on the cross, repentance is always possible. It's always possible. I don't care where you've been lately. You can change if you trust in Jesus. That's what communion reminds us. And so as we remember that, let's make it our prayer that we wouldn't, that we wouldn't just go through the motions and read the scriptures and go to church and take communion and then do nothing afterwards. But may we be a people that would say, you know what, I've got one shot of this life. I'm gonna make the most of it. I'm gonna take the grace I've been granted and I'm gonna walk the way that God wants me to walk. And I'm not going to do it perfectly, but I'm going to do it faithfully. And when I fall down, I'm going to get back up and I'm going to keep cutting off those distractions and I'm going to cultivate the things that matter most. Let's do that as a, as a body. I'm there with you, struggling with you. But together, by his grace, we can overcome. If you would, tear back that first layer on your cups and we'll take it together as a family. In God's word, it says this. It says, The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Church, the body of Christ. Take and eat. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Church, the blood of Christ, take and drink. Would you pray with me? Well, Father God, I... I can't speak for everybody here. I don't know the hearts of everyone that's here, but I know my heart. And I know I so often can get so self-centered and I can get so tired and then I just consume things hoping they would fill me, but, but I'm just running away from you. I get so distracted, God. And when I get distracted, I neglect the things that mean most to me. God, I don't want to be that type of man. I don't want to waste my life. I want to live it. So God, would you help me to be a better husband, to prioritize time with my wife? God, would you help me to be a better father, to be present around my kids, to give them the time that they need? God, would you help me to work hard, but but not overwork? Would I make time to rest and to be still so that I can hear your still small voice that I know is leading me? God, we need your grace. These are hard times to be alive. So much noise, so much chaos. But God, you knew what you were doing when you created us and you put us in this very exact moment so that we would be a shining representation of what true wisdom looks like. And so God, may you help us to be a shining beacon for your glory. We pray all of this in the powerful and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing this closing song together? Time and time again You have proven You do just what you say Though the storms may come And the winds may blow You remain steadfast And let my heart learn When you speak a word It will come to pass Great is your 
Your name, great is your faith. 